The Czech Republic is small but dense with history and beauty. We have 14 places on the UNESCO World Heritage List, which is pretty impressive for such a small place. In a previous episode, we looked at the first six to make it onto the list, and in this one, we'll look at the next six to make it on the list, focusing most of our attention in Moravia, the eastern half of the country. A city is much more than just a collection of buildings. It's a location, it's a history, it's a culture, it's ideas and ideals, and a city is also, most importantly, the people in it. This is Prague Times, the podcast that takes a look at the city of Prague in the Czech Republic. With more than a thousand years of history, there's a lot to talk about. We'll talk about the past of Prague, but we'll also talk about the city as it is today, future plans for the city, and much more. It's Prague then, Prague now, and Prague later. And this is Prague Times. Nineteen ninety eight saw two places make it on the list. The first one is the gardens and castle at Kromerzij in eastern Moravia, about twenty five kilometers northwest of Zlin. The main building started out as the primary residence for the bishops and archbishops of Olomouc. The first one was built in 1497, which was then sacked in 1643 in the Thirty Years' War. In 1664, the Liechtenstein family, who would create so many wonderful and eccentric things in the Lednica Voltica area, listen to the previous UNESCO episode for information on that, decided to renovate the late Gothic ruins into a new Baroque palace. They hired Italian Swiss architect Filberto Lucchesi, who'd already made a name for himself with some astonishing works around Europe, including the Leopoldine wing of the Hofburg in Vienna. He set to work with gusto, reimagining the castle and designing a massive pleasure garden in front. But he died two years later, in 1666, so the work was finished by his collaborator, Giovanni Pietro Tancala, who modified the garden project with ideas from his native city of Torino in northern Italy. Then a major fire broke out in 1752, ruining much of the interior, so Prince Bishop Maximilian Reichsgraf von Hamilton, yes, his name was Hamilton, his family had originally come from Scotland, he asked renowned Imperial Rococo master Franz Anton Maubech and Moravian Silesian artist Josef Stan to go wild and do whatever they wanted. And boy, did they. In addition, the complex acquired an impressive art collection, including Titans, the Flaying of Marcias, a massive library of more than 33,000 books and documents, and a huge archive of sheet music. And yet, Europe's full of this kind of stuff. The castle complex is, quote, a good but not outstanding example of a type of aristocratic or princely residence that has survived widely in Europe, according to the original UNESCO listing, but it has since been modified to be a bit more um, complimentary. But it's those gardens that really set the place apart. There's the castle garden, 58 hectares with architectural elements like colonnades and sculptures from Pompeii scattered among exotic trees, as well as gorgeous bridges over streams and ponds. You can have fun on a boat in the long pond in warmer months or skate on the frozen surface in the winter. The garden also got a little bit of a romantic style makeover in the late 18th, early 19th century, so it's a true blend of styles and eras. And then there's the Pleasure Garden, also called the Garden of Lust. <laughs> Southwest of the center of town, a formal Italian garden entered through a 244-meter-long arcade gallery. It's all geometric with mazes and geometry-inspired flower beds, and the centerpiece is an octagonal rotunda in the middle of it all. There's also a walking path that spirals around the garden, leading to aviaries and greenhouses. This area is first used in cinema when Milos Forman returned to Czechoslovakia to film his 1984 Oscar-winning Amadeus. Some of the interiors here were used as stand-ins for the Hofburg in Vienna, and since then it's featured in a number of movies. The site would go on to greatly influence Baroque gardens and palaces throughout Europe and remains one of the finest examples of its type anywhere on the continent. The town of Kromerzij is also worth looking around. Among some of the very old buildings is a Jewish town hall, one of the very few in the country. If you want to hang out in the area a while longer, just 30 kilometers or so to the southeast is the city of Zlin. At about 75,000 people, it's the 10th largest in the country. Zlin started off as a craft guild center for Moravian Wallachia back in the 14th century and then just sort of chugged along until the Industrial Revolution hit the Czech lands, getting up to about 3,000 residents by the 1890s. 
Then in 1894, manufacturer and local son Tomasz Batia opened up a massive shoe factory here and a whole new city essentially was built around the factory. He ended up becoming mayor in 1923. That's how much the new town got associated with him. As the factory expanded, so did the city of Zlin. The new housing is a showcase of Moravian functionalism. More about that architectural style later in the bit about the Tukentat Villa in Brno. Le Cabassier was originally asked to design extensions to the growing city in the 1920s, but the job ended up going to local boy Franciszek Gahura, who was a former student of Le Cabassier. Everything centered on the factory, which employed thousands of people. Rather famously, Batia's office was a huge glass elevator that allowed him to visit different floors and check on progress without ever having to leave his desk. It also allowed him to root out communists from his employees. He was very anti-communist. Maybe that's why, when the Communist Party took over after World War II, they renamed the whole city Gottwaldov, after Czechoslovakia's first communist president, the Stalinist butcher responsible for the White Terror. It remained with this name until 1990, and then it went back to being called Zlin. However, those who missed the good old days of the communist dictatorship would routinely swap the city signs that said Zlin for ones that said Gottwaldov, and then the city would have to change the signs back. Where they kept all these city signs is a mystery. This went on all through the 1990s. Bacha himself never learned of the slight from the communists, if that's what it was, since he died in an airplane crash in 1932. The city is very much worth a visit, especially if Czech functionalism and architectural cubism are interesting to you. There's quite a bit to do. It's a city. There's a large shoe museum, which should come as no surprise. Famous people born here include Czech star architect Eva Jeřičná, now British playwright Tom Stoppard, former BBC Two Newsnight presenter and managing director of both the BBC World Service and London's Barbican Centre, John Tusa, born Jan Tusha, Donald Trump's first wife, Ivana Zelnichkova, better known as Ivana Trump, and Sylvia Tomchalova, better known to the world as porn actress Sylvia Saint. The city is renowned for its beautiful women, as if they're a commodity. In fact, when I first moved to this country, I'd heard the most beautiful women in the whole country are in Zlin. There certainly were a lot of them, since the shoe factory mainly employed women in the 1990s, just after the revolution, the ratio of women to men in the city was 7 to 1. I assume the imbalance has been corrected since then. The second location to make the list in 1998 was the much more modest Holashovica Historical Village Reservation. That's Holashovica with an A, not Holeshovica with an E, here in the Prague 7 district in the capital. Far from being grand, this is an extremely well-preserved village consisting really of one long common village green surrounded by a handful of buildings. What makes these old farmsteads interesting is that they are perhaps the best preserved example of what has come to be known as South Bohemian Folk Baroque. The town is first mentioned in documents way back in 1263 and was given to the Cistercian Monastery at Vichy Broad by King Wenceslaus II. The Black Plague swept through here between 1520 and 1525, killing everybody in the village but two. The monastery repopulated it with immigrants from Bavaria and northern Austria, and Holoshavica became a Sprachsinsel, or language island, a German-speaking area completely surrounded by Czech speakers. In the year 1900, only one of its 164 residents was of Czech extraction. In the late 18th and throughout the 19th century, most of the homes were redone in this South Bohemian folk Baroque style, which is wholly unique to this sub-region. Then World War II came along, and after that, well, Germans were not so welcome. The village was completely deserted after World War II and remained empty throughout the entire period of communism, literally a ghost town sitting abandoned and neglected. Then in 1990, after the Velvet Revolution, people started returning to Holoshevitsa, and today it has about 140 residents. Most of the buildings are privately owned, but the pub at house number 19, the forge, number 23, and blacksmith's house, number 43, and the 1755 St. John of Nepomuk Chapel are all owned by the town. It's a kind of a sad little museum and a number of pilgrimage crosses around, plus a restaurant in addition to the pub. Just on the southeast edge of the city, there's the Holoshevica Stonehenge, a series of rings made of old standing stones. Two years ago, my wife and I went to Holoshevica and decided to check this site out. To our great disappointment, we learned that this Stonehenge was built in 2008 
by the Yilkova family, who are owners of the local Yehobrik Stone Company. Oh, they have plenty written up on signs around the site talking about landscape energies and psychotronics, whatever the hell that is, and the wisdom of the ancients and so on. The website actually tells you how to behave when in the stone circles so as to absorb the best meditative energies and not disturb others, and also that pregnant women should not enter the area because of all the super strong mystical energies harnessed by arranging big rocks in circles. Also, no climbing on the rocks and no dogs. Oh, and when you go there, they want you to pay an entry fee. And at least when we were there, a scowling woman on a scooter cart drove up and checked that we had, in fact, paid. For a place that purports to be all about the hippy-dippy groovy energies, man, it sure got a pretty cranky vibe. In an amusing way, if you don't let it get to you. The main thing to keep in mind is that this whole meditative energy shtick is just that, a shtick designed to get you to pay up. It's really just a tourist attraction and an advertisement for the stone company who also makes wood briquettes and earthworks. They are in the process of building more circles. The next year, 1999, Litomichel Castle was added to the list. First built in the late 1500s as a residence for the Penstein family, this is a rather unique structure. This three-floor Renaissance chateau has four asymmetrically arranged wings surrounding an arcaded courtyard. There's a chapel in the east wing and a well-preserved late 18th century theater complete with scenery machinery of the time in the west wing. It was here that composer Bedri Smetana, who was born in the former brewery next door in 1824, first performed for the public on a piano. The main attraction, though, is the exterior, which is decorated in possibly the finest example of sgraffito in Central Europe. This is a technique that became very popular in the Renaissance in which layers of contrastingly colored plaster are applied to a wet surface and then decorative designs or images are scratched into the plaster while it's still wet and then it hardens. You can see this technique all over the place, but what makes this place different is that no two of the 8,000 decorated bricks is the same. They're all different, or so they say. I haven't actually checked all 8,000 of them. The interior has become a museum with two different tour routes, each one costing 160 crowns. Okruch 1, which is kind of the main tour, takes you through the west wing, and Okruch 2, which takes you through the east wing. There's all sorts of furniture and dishes and historical keyboard instruments and other trappings of a noble family inhabiting the various rooms. The interior design is also noteworthy, having also been used by Milos Forman for his film Amadeus. After a fire in 1726, most of the interior was redone in the Baroque style by Franciszek Maximilian Kanka, who also did the St. John Nepomuk Church in Kutnohora, Konopistia outside of Prague, and the St. Procopius facade in Trzebic, which is also on the UNESCO list and we'll talk about later. On the castle grounds, there's a Baroque pavilion and an English-style garden, as well as a French garden to relax in. I say castle, but the word in Czech for this building is zamek. The root of that word is the same as the word lock, and it's usually translated as chateau into English, which is kind of funny that's in English because it's a French word. But sometimes zamek is translated as castle if it's an especially large one like this one is. Frankly, the word palace is probably the best translation of all. The town itself is also worth seeing. There's a charming creek running here, the Lochna. I mean, the Czechs call it a river, but at least here, it's a creek. And lots of lovely buildings, notably the 16th century House of the Knights at number 110 on the main square. It's a good-sized town, about 10,000 people, and has a long history. Probably originally a camp for the Litomirici people, a group of Western Slavs who settled the area in the late 6th century, a vital trade route between Bohemia and Moravia would develop here, making the town rather important. Bohemia's second bishopric was founded here in 1344. As mentioned, famous composer Bedrich Smetana was born and grew up here, and every year the town holds a massive 10-day opera festival in his honor. The main square of the town is, unsurprisingly, called Smetanovo Namjesti. It's one of the longest squares in the country, and like Telch, which is mentioned in the previous UNESCO episode, is almost totally surrounded by arcades beneath the Baroque and neoclassical facades of the buildings above. There's also a Museum of Antique Sculpture and Architecture, a museum to Smetana in his old family home, and the super interesting Portmonium, which is just down the street from the Veselka Microbrewery. 
This is the former home of a civil servant named Josef Portman, who was a huge fan of local offbeat self-taught artist Josef Wachel. He collected Wachel's work and finally commissioned him to cover the walls of two rooms in the house completely with murals. Wachel's style is, well, pretty interesting and kind of disturbing, and the rooms have images of demons and uneasy spirits, the artist himself as a rat catcher, a large crucifixion, quotes from Hindu religious texts, and much, much more. It's a quite unusual spot, especially when you consider that from the outside, it looks just like a regular house. Admission is 70 crowns. The Zamek also has a permanent exhibition of sculptures by native son Obram Zobek, who did the 2002 Memorial to the Victims of Communism here in Prague at the base of Petshin Hill, which was talked about in our David Cherney tour episode. In fact, art's kind of a big deal all around in Lito Michel, and there are numerous gallery spaces and workshops around town. Lito Michel is worth a trip. Less than 20 kilometers to the southeast, there's also the town of Svitavi, a major transit hub and where Oscar Schindler of Schindler's List fame was born and started his first factory. It's a little bigger than Lito Michel with 16,000 people. It also houses the Czech Esperanto Museum because the Czechs were really into the artificial language of Esperanto way back when. Kind of, I guess I can see the appeal of a universal language when the language that you have is super complicated like Czech. When the Esperanto Center in San Francisco closed, the one here in is Svitabi was the last one in the world before it too closed in the early noughties. The town center is also very well preserved and quite nice. And if you still want to hang out in the area, the small city of Cheska Trebova, about 15,000 people, is only 13 kilometers northeast of Litomyshul and it is also worth a visit. For the millennium in 2000, UNESCO added the Holy Trinity Column in Olomots to the list. Another example of work from the Baroque period, this is in Moravian Baroque style. This 35 meter, that's 115 foot tall column, is the largest Baroque sculptural group in the country. It was finished in 1754, having started 38 years earlier in 1716. The plague had come through Moravia between 1713 and 1715, the local follow-up to a massive outbreak a few years earlier during the Great Northern War in Scandinavia, Northern Germany, the Baltic, Prussia, and Poland that killed nearly 200,000 people. This plague was one of several plagues that would sweep through the region. Now, in Central Europe, it became a thing to sometimes build something called a Marian Column after a tragedy or disaster, usually plague. These were sort of kind of based on imperial Roman columns that usually had the emperor on top of them, but these were often crowned with the Virgin Mary or something like that, often surrounded by grim imagery taken from the horrible events that the column is commemorating, and sometimes even from the Book of Revelation. The first one north of the Alps was in Munich in 1638 to mark the fact that the city had not been ravaged by the invading Swedes and also that the plague had given Munich a miss. One on Old Town Square here in Prague was built just after the Thirty Years' War, but in the First Republic it was torn down as a symbol of Catholicism, which had been forced upon the Czechs for 400 years. However, last year this column was reconstructed and re-erected. Vienna has a huge, beautiful one that's kind of the model for all such columns here in Central Europe, built after the 1679 plague. The idea behind these is sort of, hey, thanks for not killing all of us. And even though there's the occasional plague column, as they're also known in Munich or Vienna, they're really mainly a thing here in the Czech lands. You'll find them in many towns. Uh, Kutnohora has a particularly lovely one, as does the northern Moravian town of Schumperk. But many, many towns have one. And yet the one in Olomouc is probably the most magnificent of them all. When it was unveiled in 1754, Habsburg Empress Maria Theresa and her husband attended the ceremony. It was considered to be such a great work of ecclesiastical art that when the Prussians invaded four years later, the locals begged them not to shoot it. They'd already hit it a couple of times, but upon seeing it for themselves, they agreed and left it alone. Up on the column, you can see a gold-gilded replica of one of the stone shots that hit the column before the deal was brokered. All the artists who worked on it, five of whom died while it was being built, ironically, were Olomouc locals, and even the saints and figures were often somehow connected with Moravia. 
On the top is the Holy Trinity and a son, then the angel Gabriel hanging around, and Mary is being taken to heaven beneath that. Under all of that, you have 18 sculptures of figures like Saints Anne and Joachim, who were Mary's mom and dad, Saint Joseph, Mary's husband, Saint John the Baptist, who proclaimed her son Jesus to the world. You've got figures representing the virtues of faith, hope, and love. Cyril and Methodius, who brought Christianity to the Czechs and other Slavs, St. John of Nepomuk, St. Wenceslas, St. John of Capistrano, who was once a priest in Olomouc, St. John Sarkander, a local priest who was tortured to death in the local prison by the Swedes during the Thirty Years' War, the Twelve Apostles, and much, much more. It's ornate. The city of Olomouc is also very much worth checking out. Fifth largest city by population, a little over 100,000 people. It was once the seat of the bishops of Olomouc and has been a settlement since Slavs first came into the area. Maybe even before that, it's thought that maybe before the Slavs, the site was an old Roman fort called Mount Julius, which in Latin is Iulio Montium. Over time, this name, Iulio Montium, morphs into Olomouc. It's got some great buildings and churches, six Baroque fountains, a rare heliocentric astronomical clock that was redone in 1955 by the communists with social realist style workers and important communist days like the birthdays of Stalin and Gottwald. It also has Palatsky University, the oldest in Moravia and the second oldest in the country, established in 1573. In fact, this is a college town. The student population from Palaski and other schools in the town, like the Moravian College, equal about a quarter of the total population. So, as you can imagine, it gets pretty swinging at night, like most college towns. However, during the summer break and at weekends, when most students return home to have mom wash their clothes and get a home-cooked meal, it can feel quite empty. It's a great city and totally worth checking out. It will also get an episode of Prague Times all its own someday in the future. Another Moravian city that will get its own episode someday is the capital of Moravia and the country's second city, Brno. What we're going to talk about here is the early 20th century Tugendhat Villa, which got on the UNESCO list in 2001. But first, a little bit of architectural history. In 1896, Chicago architect Louis Sullivan said, Form follows function and a new way of approaching design was born. Though he meant function a bit more kind of a woo-woo kind of a way, like the thing's essential essence, its function in the metaphor that is the universe as experienced by human minds. But anyway, a stripped-down aesthetic started to emerge. In architecture, two of the pioneers are Franco-Swiss Le Corbusier and Aachen-born Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. In the 1920s, Czechoslovakia was getting high on being their own nation for the first time in 400 years and rarely got on board with this most modern of modern ideas. In fact, it was Czechs, or more specifically Moravians, who were some of the most prevalent drivers of this new architectural form known as functionalism, of which it could be argued that the Bauhaus ideas started in 1919 by Walter Gropius were a type, though some people argue that functionalism is actually a type of Bauhaus anyway. They're very similar. When industrialist Fritz Tugendhat decided he wanted the most modern, modern villa he could get for him and his wife Greta, he hired the modernist Mies van der Rohe and interior designer Lili Reich to build him something special. And they did. This spacious, reinforced concrete home would become one of the icons of the modernist and functionalist movements. The idea behind it was less is more, a phrase often credited to van der Rohe himself, though it actually first was seen in an 1855 poem by Robert Browning called Andrea del Sarto. The three-story house sits on the edge of a small hill, so the ground floor is really the second floor as the first floor sits slightly downslope. Van der Rohe used an iron framework, and so as a result, he didn't need any interior supporting walls. This allowed him to create a huge living room that's a single space with a massive sliding wall made entirely of glass looking out over the back garden, which tumbles down from the top of the hill and makes the view itself architecturally part of the room. This glass curtain could descend on motors all the way down to the basement, leaving the entire wall open for people in the living room. There's no art on the walls, but clever use of materials makes this irrelevant. A brown gold wall made of onyx from the Atlas Mountains in Morocco gives one a sense of depth and texture, and other surfaces are covered in rare woods from tropical climes. All the lines are clean and simple, minimalist, but not plain. And because it was so modern, it boasted the very state-of-the-art when it came to heating and the, at the time, very unusual addition of a new invention called air conditioning. 
While Van der Rohe sketched out the designs for all the furnishings, which have a kind of a stripped down deco feel to them, it was really Lily Reich who made the non-architectural elements sing. In fact, two of the chairs designed just for this home are still made today. The modernist cantilever Tugendhat chair with a padded leather seat and leather straps for the back over a polished stainless steel frame, and the Brno chair, a single steel frame bent in a C with a leather back and a taut seat. In 2005, British art historian Dan Cruikshank put the Brno chair on his list of 80 man-made treasures. Variations of the Brno chair would become the de facto standard for office chairs in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Alas, the Tugendhats were Jewish. So when it looked like the Nazis were going to get their way in 1938, this is just a few months before the disastrous Munich Agreement, after only getting delivered their wonderful new home for eight years, they fled. They went to Switzerland, sat out the war in Venezuela, far from the action, and then returned to Switzerland. They would never again live in the house. The Gestapo occupied the villa during the Nazi occupation, making some changes and stealing quite a bit of the stuff inside. In 1942, they rented it to Willy Messerschmitt to use as a combination home and offices for his airplane works. When the Red Army liberated Brno in 1945, they stabled their horses, yes, their horses, in the house. The heavy animals damaged the linoleum floor, and the soldiers used whatever furniture was left over for firewood. Under the communists, the building was used as a number of things, including a psychiatry center for children. In 1967, Greta came back with an architect from Van der Rohe's Chicago studio, and they enlisted the help of some local architects and workers to try and restore as much as possible, with mixed success. For example, somewhere in all of this, that massive glass curtain wall got broken, but the communists were unable to replicate it. They couldn't make a pane of glass that large that was stable. So they replaced it with a number of smaller fixed glass windows instead. In 1992, after the Velvet Revolution, Prime Minister Václav Klaus used the villa to sign the agreement with Slovak Prime Minister and former boxer and thug Vladimir Mečiar that would result in Slovakia breaking off to become its own country, known colloquially as the Velvet Divorce. It then became a museum administered by the city of Brno. In 2007, the Tugendhat descendants rather thought that the new post-communist laws about restituting confiscated property should apply to them and that they would get the villa back, but they were unprepared for Czech bureaucracy. The city argued that the Tugendhats had left of their own accord in 1938 before the Nazis occupied Brno, and so, therefore, it didn't really matter. Also, it's not technically the same building because many of the extensive renovations that were supposed to be carried out in 1967 did not, in fact, occur. Entire sections of the interior were missing. At one part, bits of the original wall were found at Masaryk University, which had been the Gestapo's administrative buildings during the Nazi occupation. So, no joy for the Jugendhats. In 2010, serious reconstruction work finally got underway, and it is now pretty close to how it originally was. You may have seen the inside of the Jugendhat villa. It was the home of Vladis Gutas, the villain of the 2007 film Hannibal Rising, played by Rhys Ifans, and also starring Gaspard Ulil as Hannibal Lecter and Dominic West as Inspector Pascal Popil. British writer Simon Mauer wrote a novel called The Glass Room in 2007 and nine, very much based on the story of the Tugendhats and this building. That book was shortlisted for the Booker Prize and on numerous top books of the year lists, including the Washington Post and The Economist. The villa was closed during the COVID-19 lockdown, but promises that they will be reopening in September this year, unless, you know, things change. The last item on our list was added in 2003, and it's a twofer in Trebich, a Moravian city of 35,000 people. You've got the Jewish Quarter and the St. Procopius Basilica. The Trebich Jewish Quarter is one of the best preserved in all of Europe and is the only UNESCO-listed specifically Jewish site outside of Israel. And the attendant Jewish cemetery, which is part of the listing, is one of the best preserved and largest in the country, with about 11,000 bodies and somewhere between three and 4,000 headstones, all from the Renaissance, Baroque, and Classicist periods, though there's one that goes all the way back to 1631. The Jewish quarter itself, okay, I mean, let's call it what it was, the former ghetto, has 123 houses and two synagogues. The houses are 
tall and split into apartments in which as many as 16 people could have been co-owners of the building, sort of proto-condos, if you will. Rather unusually for Europe, the ghetto had its own government. One reason the Jewish community was so large here is that the local magistrate ignored an order to expel all Jews in the 16th century. But a ghetto is still a ghetto, and over time, the population dwindled. By 1890, there were only 1,500 Jewish people living here, and by 1930, this had dropped to about 300. Of those left when the Nazis swept through, all of them were shipped off to concentration camps, and only 10 individuals survived. Needless to say, though the buildings remain preserved, they are no longer owned by Jewish people. The other part of the listing is the Romanesque Gothic St. Procopius Basilica, which sits up on a hill looking over the city. In 1104, a Romanesque chapel was built here by the residents of the Benedictine Monastery next door, originally devoted to the Ascension of Mary. And then this was converted into a much larger basilica in the 13th century, finished in 1260. So who's the St. Procopius guy? He was a hermit who lived in a cave along the banks of the Sazava River, and he ended up becoming a kind of a leader of a whole bunch of cave-dwelling hermits. His remains are now in the Church of All Saints at Prague Castle. The monastery and basilica were attacked by Hussite troops in the early 15th century, then by the Hungarian king Matthias Corvinus, who was trying to pry Hussite King George of Podjebrady's son Victorine out from hiding there. The monastery sort of wound down as anti-Catholic sentiment grew, and the complex passed to the Osovsky family of Dobravica, who used the basilica as a horse stable. What's with people putting horses in old buildings? The monastery's crypt was used by the family as a beer cellar. The building once again became a religious structure once the Habsburgs kind of took over in 1620, and Catholicism was once again the faith of the lands under the influence of Count John Joseph Waldstein in this region. And then in the early 1700s, the whole thing was rebuilt in the Baroque Gothic style. So all told, it's an impressive building with a long and varied history, sitting rather grandly looking over the city. It has a pretty rare 10-part rose window, very hard to find, a style known as a botanical rose window for those that are into rose windows. The center of Trzebic, the city, is a protected urban monument zone under Czech law, boasting the largest clock face in the country. That's the kind of thing we pay attention to here. Some people say it has the largest clock tower in all of Europe. <clears throat> maybe, maybe not. It has one of the longest squares in the country, Karlovo Namiesti, or Charles Square, and also one of the smallest, Ticha Namiesti, or Quiet Square, in the Jewish quarter next to the old synagogue. Archaeological finds in the area include an unusual crystal blade from somewhere around 35 to 39,000 BCE, found in Mohelno, which is about halfway to Brno, fertility statues from the 4th millennium BCE, and an Italian-made bronze dagger from the 2nd millennium BCE. There are a few zameks in the area as well, notably Namjes nad Oslovo, also about halfway to Brno, Jaromjarzice nad Rokitno, which is 15 kilometers south, and Budishov, which is about 15 kilometers northeast. The town of Yihlava is 35 kilometers away, and Brno is 65 kilometers away. It's also only about 26 kilometers or so from the Dukovani nuclear power station, which was built on the side of a village named Dukovani that was completely flattened to make room for the country's first nuclear power plant. Near Dukovani is Tempelstein, the ruin of an old Templar castle and one of the several castle ruins in the area, and there are also numerous Celtic sites. I used to stay in Trebic when I taught English to workers at the Dukovani nuclear power plant, and I would stay at the Hotel Atom. Obviously, a reference to the nuclear power plant. According to the website, it looks like the Hotel Atom has gotten something of a facelift since my day, which is a good thing. So that's six, and with the previous six in the previous episode, that's 12 all told. And it would stay that way until 2019. That year, two more places, or rather regions, made it onto the list. Next time we do a UNESCO listing episode, we will talk about those two and also start going down the list of places on the tentative list, places that the Czechs think should also go on the list, and UNESCO is thinking about it. So until then, happy travels. Thank you for listening to this episode of Prague Times. If you liked this episode, be sure to like it. 
or share it and tell your friends. Check us out on all of our social media platforms for extra goodies as well. Until next time, this has been Prague Times.